microphone. Good morning, everybody. Uh, instead of uh, offering you an activity to get you with, uh, familiar with our project, we thought I'd give it uh, two minutes to try and visualize how we are connected, to provide you with some sort of small introduction to see how we somehow try and support the same goals. Uh, and these goals are huge. So we are all working uh, towards making a plurilingual Europe a reality. And uh, you could look at that from at least two perspectives. And that's what we've been uh, trying to do with our three projects. So one is certainly, uh, one axis that we need to consider is certainly uh, related to the dimension of breadth. So how can we make sure that our students actually become plurilingual, that they learn more languages. How do we make that a reality in schools? That is where Kirsten and the Plurcore team have been highly active. And she will introduce models, materials, and so on to show what they've been doing in their project. But that's not all. We need at least as much depth as we need breadth when it comes to language learning. The breadth is essential because we need to make sure that our students will become successful meaning makers, that they can communicate that meaning across cultures, across subjects. So we need to deal with the aspect of language as a tool for knowledge creation and communication. And that is another dimension that we will try and tackle in our presentation. And that is something that Ellie and her project on language descriptors have been uh, busy with. So that is the language descriptor project. And finally, our project, the Pluriliteracies project, deals with the question of how we can enable students to develop those pluriliteracies, which means to successfully communicate content across cultures and subjects. So we are somehow in the middle trying to bridge those different axes. And we will have developed models, uh, materials, to show how that can be done in a real school context. So that is our Pluriliteracies project. And now let me hand over to Ellie, who will talk about uh, the descriptors and introduce her project. Hello. I'm Eli Mo from Norway, and I have been the coordinator of this uh, project with a long name, Language Descriptors for Migrant and Minority Learners' Success in Compulsory Education. We have been four regular team members, uh, José Pascual from Portugal, Melute Ramonjen from Lithuania, Marita Hermele from Finland and myself from Norway. In addition, we had uh, an associate member from Canada, uh, pa Paula Christmansen, who also contributed to the project. Uh, in many ways, we could say that the main aim of compulsory education is to prepare students for the future. Uh, by empowering them with relevant skills and knowledge. And uh, there seems to be a growing understanding that in order to build knowledge, you need language. And we see in many countries that uh, basic skills are integrated in, in uh, all subjects, in curriculum goal, or goals of all subjects. To learn science, you need to be able to read your textbooks, other texts you get, your tasks. You need to be able to understand what the teacher says. You need to be able to uh, communicate uh, your knowledge in, sp in speech and in writing. So um, this was... Uh, so one of our starting points was what Biarco says, whatever the subject, all knowledge building in the school context involves working with language. That was one of our starting points. The other was that uh, all team members had a background in sec second language assessment and teaching, uh, some also in uh, second language acquisition theories. And we knew that 
many second language users, men, they have problems uh, learning uh, or building knowledge in school, not not before, because they cannot build not build knowledge, but because uh, their lack of language uh, hinders them. So this is um, our starting point. So the focus of our our um, uh, project is the language of schooling, the language normally used for teaching in school. In Norway, that would often or most often be Norwegian, in, in, in uh, Portugal it's Portuguese and so on. In addition, we ha needed to focus on two, we needed to focus on specific language groups. So we uh, decided to focus on the 12, 13 year olds and the 15, 16 year olds since they, in a way, they represent uh, the trans two transition transition phases from primary to lower secondary school and from lower secondary to upper secondary school in many countries. And we also wanted to focus on two different subjects, which we thought were very different. We chose mathematics and history. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, you can go on. So we had two aims for the project. The first one was to uh, develop descriptors for mathematics and history, language descriptors for mathematics and history, linked to the common European framework. And we chose to develop descriptors for the levels A2 to B2. And the second uh, aim was to indicate minimum standards. How much language do 12, 13 year old need to have in the, in the language of schooling in order to reach competence goals? Uh, so, um, yeah, this, and uh, uh, maybe you could uh, wait a little bit. Um, so, uh, when we developed the, had developed the descriptors, we had 79 uh, language experts from all over Europe who validated the descriptors by, uh, by uh, assigning them to different framework levels. And then we used this, that as a basis for deciding the final framework level for each descriptor. In addition, we gave the descriptors to 230 teachers of mathematics and uh, history, and we asked them to identify the subject they represented and also the age group uh, which they uh, represented. And so they, and the question they answered was, uh, how uh, do my students need to know this? in order to reach the competence goals in this subject? And the teachers answered yes or no. Uh, so, we have descriptors. We think they can be used for, uh, I think you can go on. The website, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, they can be used to raise an awareness that Language is important when learning uh, <coughs> a subject and building knowledge. They can be used to determine objectives for lessons. They can also be used as formative uh, uh, assessment criteria and also for self-assessment. Uh, and then more or less my last slide here. Uh, the result from uh, the questionnaires we had and what the teachers gave us feedback on is that uh, students studying mathematics and history, the ones who are 12, 13 year olds, they need a B1 competence, both, uh, both to reach competence goals in mathematics and history. And the ones 
uh, at uh, who are six, 15, 16 year olds, they need a B2 competence. Yeah. And then I think we'll go to our website. Uh, in our website, you can find, find the whole publication, uh, which could be downloaded. The publication tells you about the background for the study, what we did, our results, and it also includes the language descriptors. Uh, but if you don't want to read the whole uh, a whole publication, you are perhaps interested in parts of it. You can go to this circle and focus on specific parts of the publication. In addition, up to the right, you can see, um, you can click on, uh, there are, I think you have to go a bit, yeah, further up. There are the language descriptors in six different languages. English and French were our project languages, so they are of course in English and French. And in addition, they are in all the team members' languages. So they are also in Lithuanian, Finnish, Portuguese and Norwegian. So if you click on the English version, perhaps, uh, there you will see this is the is it the listening descriptors first, yeah? Oh, did, we, oh, did I click on the wrong one? No, I think it's, it's okay. It's the listening first, yeah? Yes. And you see there are descriptors for uh, A2. Uh, you, to the left you see all the language functions, and then we have descriptors for A2, B1, and B2. And if you go further down, you will have the descriptors for reading, uh, speaking, and writing. Uh, I d don't have time to go into it. But if you, uh, if you go back, Oliver, you can uh, also go into the, the next, the, the, uh, this, yes. This one, the listening? Or reading. Okay. Uh, here you can see the language function and the level uh, the th teachers think students students uh, need to be at in mathematics and history. Sometimes it's an in-between level, B1, B2. I won't go into that now, but in the publication this is explained. Uh, other things I should uh, show about uh, the website? Assessment. Yeah, there. In the publication there is a is a part addressed to how the descriptors could be used. Uh, it's for teachers. And uh, here on the website you can see just as uh, a self-evaluation scheme uh, where some of the descriptors are included. So I just end my presentation by saying welcome to our website. Go. Lovely, thank you Oliver. I would like to start with uh, just a copy of the PowerPoint. My email address is in it, just in case you have further questions because we're limited to time. Feel free to send me an email, I have to check my emails every day. I hope that's okay if I stand, we can try. And also, as the ECML, I'm also active with projects from the EU Commission, but you have the old Procur flyer in this pack as well, so, um, <coughs> which is this one, there are two, the, the really, really old one, then the one in the middle, and then later on after we're finishing, oh, okay, then I probably need the... Or I can take the, the other one. Uh, okay. Yeah. We get there. We get there. Huh? Together. Yes. Is it better now? I hope. Yeah. 
Sorry about that. Yes, I thought this would have been a wider range and ah, microphones. Not so fond about, but has to be done. So I'm just repeating. I disseminated the copy of the PowerPoint. You have my email address on it, so you're more than welcome. Send me an email if you have further questions. And dissemination is really important, as we have heard, and we'll hear more from the ECML. But I'm also involved in EU Commission-funded uh, projects. Plus, in that pack, you have the previous flyers from Plurquor, and the new ones are ready here for you to take away as well. So I'm passing these ones around, please take one. These are projects in the language area, both EU Commission and ECML. And Frank, thank you so much. Yes, Bring, pass them by and forward them to your colleagues who deal in languages. And I don't need to bring them back to Ireland anymore. My suitcase will be a bit lighter. So I'm delighted to be here. Britta Hufeisen is the coordinator of and unfortunately can't be here. So I'm trying my best to give you an overview. So delighted that I have the opportunity. And the next one will actually give you my email address. And Pluacor is all about whole school language curriculum. And I think what's, what I feel always excited, what I'm always excited about is that it tries to include all stakeholders, which means the whole school language curriculum, not just part of it. Okay? So summary of the presentation is in order to check, am I still able to speak my native language? I can say Gesamtsprachen curriculum. Okay? So we will talk about Plurcore. And then I would like to just give you a few words, keywords about um, that I'm delighted we got funding that Pluacur can, can live on as part of the Erasmus Plus program, uh, key activity two. It's strategic partnerships in schools and it's Plur in education. And I give a few more words later on on that one. So on the, the, the rationale of our project here, Pluacur, if you're looking at existing teaching approaches, the school environment offers you mother tongue, heritage languages, language of schooling, dialects. I mean, I, I, I just need to ask any, any language teacher, how many textbooks do you have who tap into dialects? And I know when we send students on placement to Bavaria, they might be struggling because they don't have their standard German. And in other countries, they have similar. But you have the whole diversity of languages when you're talking about secondary schools, but you're not tapping into that. So I think that project is trying to raise the aware awareness about the diversity of languages that are already existing within the secondary school environment. So yes, schools are multilingual, and students' pupils are plurilingual. You're also dealing with multi-competence as part of multi multilingualism, and I always like that phrase when you're explaining the concept, knowledge of two languages in one mind. It says so much. And then, yes, the, the language of schooling is, is part of yeah, secondary school education. But then we have specific goals. Coming from the rationale, we would like that schools will appreciate the amount of languages the variation of languages that they could tap into. And I think our projects, our pilot schools, our partner schools give examples of how to do that. If I give you an idea, in Ireland you have 160 languages. But if you ask maybe your average Irish person on the street, I can guarantee you they're not aware about that because it's not being made use of. And I think that's a bit similar coming from the school environment. Then make students, again, more aware how to use their language repertoire, including heritage languages. And I'm sad to say, again, from my own background in Ireland, I know in teacher training, being, the teachers are still being told English is enough and it's important that you have kids who become good at speaking English and forget about heritage languages, <coughs> which is, yeah. It's, it's just not, not it's, 
What is it? How to normalize, how to mainstream heritage languages has not happened in each country state of the EU, member state of the EU, EU yet. Then again, just language across the curriculum. How, how, how can you learn maths? I mean, that's very much the link with our previous presentation with Ellie, that in your teaching maths, maths, you need language. You know, the whole idea that language is not just in the language subjects. And again, I think the projects in our project will clarify that. And the integration of languages across the curriculum is very much the link with Oliver, with CLIL. Then, giving you an idea, I mean, that's the essence of CLIL. It's in German, but it's very easy to understand. So on the right, you all have the specific subject-related teaching areas, and on the left, you have the languages, and they meet, and where do they meet? Of course, going back to Oliver, in the concept of CLIL, which I don't have to explain any further. Then, on the next slide, I just wanted to share with you the prototype from Britta Hoofseisen concept of <coughs> the, the Pluocore project of introducing the heritage language as a starting base, going in a, having a school where the school of the language of schooling is German. So you have German as a foreign language. You follow on with German instructions, and then you're introducing L1, L2, L3 at various stages. You're starting with daycare, going across to grade 13. On top of that, you have the CLE or immersion classes. Then the icing of the cake should be that you motivating, hopefully, your, your students to go abroad. And that's, I think, where my research interest is. And I can only encourage, yes, there is learning happening in the classroom. And our project will emphasize that. But you can only go so far. If you learn German, you have to smell some German air <laughs> to get there. And then, um, again, my area, intercultural communication, you cannot forget the whole framework of culture. And I'm always saying this strong link between language and culture, language is a carrier of culture. And we very often forget that. And when I do language teaching or intercultural communication teaching, I know my students are not aware about that very strong link. You know, but this is the prototype. So I'm passing around our publication that will be also available in English next year. At the moment, it's just available in German. And if I have on page 11, it's a newer model, and I'm passing that one around. Please have a look. And the whole idea is that you continue with your L1, L2, L3. You don't stop in the prototype. It seems as if you stop. Also, in order to save time, you include the CLIL teaching in the language teaching. And I'm passing that one around, so please have a look. But I think it's important to show you where we were coming from by explaining the prototype to you. So the goals of Pluocore, of course, in the last two years was to pilot and assess the concept and then creating a network of schools. And I'm hoping, because we had such good feedback, I'm hoping that the networks of the schools will continue even after the project has been finished. So if you're looking more closer at the content of Plokur, yes, of course, don't need to mention we have CLIL. We have Tertia language teaching methodology, which means your L1, L2, L3 will help you in, in your language acquisition. So heritage languages can help with your language of schooling, your academic language. Receptive plurilingualism, again, the it's as, an, as a competence, and we have a specific project in our partner schools, which was Eurocom by Birgit Court. You can read on a bit further by looking at that project. And I think for me, really important is uh, the cooperation between language teachers. And it's not just language teachers, teachers in a school working together, because so often it's like separate islands and they don't come together. Then, of course, I'm talking to the converted. We need to raise language awareness, language strategies, yeah, helping learners to connect to their linguistic knowledge. As I said, 
my students are not aware about the, con the, the, the close link between language and culture, if you ask them and quiz them about it. And then make use of all the languages that our learners have, which means heritage languages, immigrant languages, minority languages, etc. Yeah, and it's so often it's a shame that we do not tap into that richness of knowledge and competences. So our project team, you can see, is here. Our working language was German because we had uh, Joachim is in Finland, but you know a German native speaker, and we had Elisabeth based in. Austria, and we also had the fortune that we had Ute Henning as a PhD student accompany our uh, project and including an important element of research. Project activities, if you're familiar with the, oh, uh, yeah, sorry, and then you have the part, I almost missed the partner schools. Yeah, we have all together, I think, eight examples on the website, which I'm going to show you in a moment, and in the publication that's going around, which at the moment is only available in German, there are 14 summaries. Yeah? So please pass it on. Then you're all familiar with the ECML that we had, you have project meetings here. We also managed to have some in Darmstadt. We had partner schools, all together 14, that were accompanied throughout the last two years to implement their projects and be able to reflect on it. That's their summary that's available on the website. Research activities are set already by my colleague Ute Henning. And then, yes, conferences. The website, we're going to look at that in a minute, yeah, at the end. And then the publication, you have the reference there, is just going around. As I said, it will be available in English. And if you want some of the German ones, you have my email address do send me an email and I will post it to you. Now I'm sidetracking ever so slightly because I wanted to share with you my joy that the project will live on and we decided to go with the EU Commission Erasmus Plus program because we wanted to keep on working in the same team. So it's for the next two years. We do very much so of the good work that already hadn't, had ha have ha happened in the ECML and continue with that, but just do a little bit more. So we will start with a needs analysis. We have partnerships with schools, and I'm delighted to say we have an Irish and a Turkish one, which are new to the project. Then we will further evaluate our school language, our whole school language curriculum, and we will focus this time more on school policy. And it's very timely because we're, we're, we're waiting from the Department of Education and Skills to publish their latest language strategy proposal, which is always a bit of a challenge because you have Irish in Ireland. So where does it fit? Now, talking about EU Commission jargon, you have intellectual outputs. So we will have the reports like we had in the ECML and they're on the websites, but we will go further and will emphasize recommendations for policy makers and school development. And again, the evaluation of what's happening. And I'm excited, we have a very nice Polish IT team, so they will do great work on our online modules. So that's just sidetracking. Conclusion, going back to Pluracore, I think on a personal reflection, I mean, I I'm, was just delighted for the two years. A lot of hard work, but thank you to the ECML, a lot of support as well, and a great opportunity to get something started and have results now available on the website and to know the project will continue to live on. But for me, that, that whole language awareness, being aware about the diversity of languages that we could tap into, if it's heritage languages or saying, you know, languages happen in all subjects at secondary schools. The so role of languages, the status of languages, and how important it is to acknowledge that and the opportunities that CLIL can give us. Then I'm a firm believer of cooperation and collaboration between all all type, of co all type of colleagues. So again, emphasizing not just language colleagues and not always talking to the diverted ones. And how important it is, I mean, I've been working in third level all my life, but I had connections to secondary schools. But in that project, again, just the, the awareness that I gained, the structures are so much more rigid 
in secondary schools. You know, you cannot just suddenly dream up a brilliant project and implement it. So how important it is to have the support by management. I give you a simple example. In our kickoff meeting for the new project, a partner school from Italy, the participant couldn't come because the principal had been away for a month and she didn't get the permission to go for you know, or filled out in time. So something simple like that, you know, I, I think I learned, I learned a lot. So going back to our workshop here, yes, I mean, we, we definitely see links to CLIL, but I also see links to Ellie and the Language Descriptors Project because all subject teaching is language teaching. And I found this nice quote, which I think is suitable to us. So I hope I'm, I always know time, and we have a, just a one minute peep at the uh, website. I hope my time. Can you just allow next one on the? Yeah, just to say thank you. And if you have the Irish one, go off, Margot. We can ask Neve now. How was my pronunciation? <laughs> but if we just have a quick look at the website, because I just wanted to show you the the, the three links on the website. Yes, lovely photograph, and. If you can just ever, that's super, that's enough. Because we don't even need to go on that because I know it's, yeah, we have, we good in time, great. Because we want to keep some time for questions. But you see the lovely blue buttons on top? So you have the introduction there. But most important, again, you have the examples. So the reflection, the reports of the school implementing their projects that was guided by the team of Procure are all listed there. You can all download the documents and research, and you can see the variation of the projects on board. And then the last button, if you would have seen the third one, are the video links. And as I said, it's not just the ones who are pilot schools, but we have, for example, a, a lovely interview with a colleague of mine in Ireland, uh, Deirdre Kirwine, who is actually a principal of a primary school, and we don't have languages, modern languages officially anymore in primary schools, the only country in the EU. So she was very active and got rewards, and it was just exactly, that's, that's her there. And what was so nice to listen to her was, by having participated in the workshop here, she was so much encouraged. And again, her belief was strengthened by saying I'm on the right track. I'm not on my own. I think that's so important. As teachers, we so often wonder, are we doing the right thing? Okay? Are we on the right track? But through the workshop here and through the project of Plurcore, she was encouraged and said, yes, we're on the right way. And I think for me, that, that's what it's all about. Encouraging, inspiring, supporting, and working together. Thank you so much indeed. And I will forward on to Oliver. Thank you. No, it was just to say that the um, the school that you mentioned there in Dublin, the video clip for, with, the, with Deirdre, is the school that David Little was talking about yesterday. Oh, yes. um, the, the school where, you know, they really have, and in fact he was telling me that these children um, have come out almost top in Ireland in the national tests in literacy. Um, so it's definitely working well. So I, I would recommend um, taking a, a look at that in, in the broader context of David's research. And, and it's really funny because so I was, when he was speaking, I kind of said, I bet, because th this primary school is so exceptional because we went, unfortunately, through the changes, changes of no more modern languages in primary schools. So you only get it if you have maybe a visiting teacher or, you know, get an initiative of the principal. So, yes, but. On to Oliver, please, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, a book that's more about, that's a spare one. If anybody wants to have it, it's only in German, so if you would like to take it home with you, it's here. Okay, good morning. Well, before I actually start presenting, I like to do something that we usually don't do. But since we are convinced that uh, what you will be see is uh, will be seeing in a minute is so good, I like to start with a very short video that was not 
created by us, not at all. But I will do my best to see how the ideas, the frameworks, and the materials of our projects uh, can be used to actually implement the, all the ideas that are shown in this video. So we will just please take a breath, relax. It's only like five minutes long, but it will make everything else uh, help me make things fall into places. So it's just five minutes. Uh, enjoy. What would you oh. guys say to teachers okay, if they're not getting high quality work? Could they learn something from this? And what would you say to them that they could do differently in their classroom? This is a story called really Austin's Butterflies. And it's a true story about a first grade boy. And his name is Austin. And he goes to school, or used to go to school, in a town called Boise, Idaho. And in his class in Boise, Idaho, they were studying butterflies. And he had to do a project. His job in the first grade was to draw a butterfly. And this is the butterfly that he picked. Austin had to use this photograph as his model, and he had to draw accurate scientific drawing of this butterfly. This is it's called okay. a tiger swallowtail. I know it. Did, can you tell Toby why it's called tiger? Because it kind of has the stripes of the tiger yeah. right there. Good. So here was Austin's job. He was supposed to do a scientific drawing of that butterfly. Doesn't matter. Oh, and now it's crashed, right? No. But remember, Austin was only in first grade. And you know what he did? He forgot to look like a scientist carefully. Really he got his paper and he just started to draw the image of a butterfly that he had in his head. And he wasn't looking like a scientist, and so this is what he drew. It's not bad, and it is a butterfly, but does it look exactly like this? No, it doesn't yet. It doesn't look exactly like this yet. And so they didn't look at this and say, good, Austin, you're done. They said, Austin, good start. Now we can start giving you critiques so you can do a second draft and make it better, and a third draft and make it better, and you can make it much, much closer to this, and he was ready to go. All of the first graders. I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, and, uh, in his critique group sat on the floor like you guys are, and they decided to split their advice into two kinds. First, just the shape of the wings. And then when the shape was right, they'd give them advice about the pattern inside the wings. Alia, what would you say? You can make it much pointier. Good. These wings could be much pointier. Who else would add something? A top, what would you say? About the angle, because not to be mean about yes. the angle, it's just not exact, so. Um, okay, so show me. Come on up here, talk. Show me where, what you would ask him to do slightly differently. Um, like to make it a little longer. Longer where? Draw where you would do it. Right there. I'm really sorry about this, but we need this. And I, I thought this, this wouldn't happen, okay? Um, because we knew we'd need it. And, um, okay, and it worked so upstairs. pull this out longer. Yeah. That's very specific, Atak. Thank you. Jamila, what would you say? It's like, Good. Jamila, I love that. So you're saying more like a triangle shape. And I agree. Well, you know what? Those first graders came up with most of those same ideas. And you know what Austin said? He said, okay, I can try. And he went back to his seat and he drew this. Does this look more like a triangle? Yeah. yeah. Did he go out further like a talk was suggesting? Yeah. Did he add some jaggedness here? Yeah. Like Cindy, did he get rid of that bottom thing? Yeah. So he did listen to his friends, and he made it better. It's not perfect. Toby, what would you say? I'd say don't put those little tail things so pointed in. I'd say put them so down. Good. OK, Ethan, what would you say? Oh, uh, I you should make That's them the like this small, like just like OK. He... Just let it play. It's okay, we just need to have the idea. He listened to his friends and they said, this is really a lot better, Austin. That second draft really is better. Yeah, maybe he could make a third one. Good, maybe he could make a third draft. And so he did this draft. That's his third draft. That's his third draft, Hadley. That's just right. Elijah, what do you notice there? Yes, I will try to, to skip to the end because I want you to, to see this. Okay, I'm terribly, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, this is uh, most unfortunate, 
But anyway, I'll try to make it work nevertheless. What we see here is progress. Uh, the reason why, I'm, why we're showing this is that when we look at CLIL and critical CLIL research, then it becomes obvious that CLIL has not fulfilled its promises. Critical research shows us that when we compare the written output in geography from L1 learners to L2 learners, there are two things that are really interesting, two, resu uh, two results. The first one is clear learners generally don't do worse than their L1 counterparts. Now, that could be considered good news. However, both groups performed suboptimally when compared to standards, which means on a general level, 16-year-olds, at least in those countries that were relevant, uh, Germany and Austria, performed not according to the standards. They were not able to express scientific or uh, subject knowledge appropriately. And that's not an issue of L1 or L2. That's a general educational problem. So all we try to do in our projects is to find ways to come up with a framework that would allow our learners, no matter the language, to move from that original drawing, which is a met metaphor for their language or their academic competencies, and develop into something like that. What we're seeing from our own teaching experience, very often we get stuck with the first stage. And then we move there. The reason for that is, uh, on an academic level, we do not yet have an integrated theory of content and language. That's a huge problem. Uh, we do not see the integration of language as a tool for learning into uh, L1 subject learning. And we do not generally have a vision of the end product. So we try to come up with a framework that would address that and develop the tools, practical materials, that would show how we as teachers can help apprentice our learners into the subjects and help them become better meaning makers. And this is what I would like to introduce to you in this very short presentation. I'm really happy we have this because this shows what people can actually do in the right learning environment with the right kind of support. And which brings me to um, our model. The thing we needed to understand was, first of all, academic language is a foreign language to students, even in their L1. So we need to make students and teachers aware of the fact that this is new. And in order to understand this, in order to make progress into a subject, and the Australians have a very nice metaphor along the knowledge pathway, we need to focus on so much more than just facts. So here is the framework that we developed with a wide uh, range of experts from many, many countries, including Canada. And it tries to connect, for the very first time, the cognitive area with the communicative in such a way that you can no longer separate it. The issue that we've been having with CLIL is that, by definition, it implies a separation of things that cannot be separated. So we needed to move beyond that to show that it is something that needs to be integrated. That is something that we've also been hearing from the language people recently. So latest uh, publications on task-based learning, for instance, say we are stuck. We are stuck in that we do not really have an understanding of how to improve complexity in our learners. We have been uh, making great advances uh, on how to improve the quantity of the language being spoken in the classroom. But just because people speak more doesn't mean they speak better. Just because people get more opportunities to write doesn't mean they get better at expressing knowledge. So that's an issue that complexity is concerned about. And Heidi Burns from uh, the United States, she puts it very clearly. She said, we need to move towards literacies. That is what we have to do. Gear complexity towards literacy. So this is the way for language learning. And uh, this is what we have been trying uh, to do. So first of all, subject teachers need to realize that knowledge of a subject 
is so much more than facts. And the most important thing that we learned from our approaches in Australia is that language is crucial in helping our students develop conceptual knowledge. It's even more than that. It is language and especially a cognitive discourse function that help our students turn isolated facts and phenomena into patterns that they can not only memorize, but which, with lots of practice and effort, they can transfer to something else. Which brings us to another crucial uh, issue. Deep learning, and there's lots of research out there, is the result of applying subject-specific strategies and skills uh, in order to gain conceptual understanding. Even though we hear that a lot, there's no evidence for such a thing as transversal skills. Deep learning is the result of going deep within a subject, and the key to that is using language to create those patterns. But there's one more thing. It is the students who need to use the language to create those patterns. If it's the teacher who models those patterns, our students will not be able to acquire that conceptual knowledge. That's a crucial uh, thing we learned, and that helped us a lot uh, towards both finalizing the framework and developing the materials for that framework uh, with the help of lots of teachers that we could invite thanks to the specific uh, setting of the ECML. So deep learning is a result of connecting both continua, the conceptual continuum with the communicating continuum. And that is our job. Oh, we have another issue. <laughs> that is supposed to say deep learning in a lot smaller font. I don't know what happens here. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, I'm pretty much more relaxed than I used to be just a couple of minutes ago. But that is what we have to do. We have to show students how to connect these continua. And one thing that we learn is that true learner-centeredness requires us teachers to really listen and observe the students and see if they can actually demonstrate their understanding by languaging their knowledge about subject-related issues. And we have to show our students how to move from novices to intermediate or advanced literacy uh, users. And uh, we can do that uh, because, with the help of many, many experts, we were able to take the concept of academic language apart and build it again. And this is the last uh, slide for our project. So we have uh, understood how uh, discourse uh, functions, how patterns, which I showed here, can be brought and sequenced to create learning progressions. We found a new type of linguistic thinking in Australia, functional linguistics, and they offer us to arrange explanations at several cognitive levels so that novices can explain at a simple level, intermediate learners at a more complex level, and advanced learner at a very technical level. And that is something that we are still very excited about. Uh, and I'd like to demonstrate that. We'll only take a minute um, uh, with the example of explaining. So um, the Australian uh, linguists like David uh, Rose, they showed us that you can basically start explaining things with a very simple pattern, which is first we did this, and then we did something else. That is how children explain. The problem with that is it's, that it's not a real explanation because it does not imply any cause and effect. So we could take this and show our students how to turn this into a better explanation, which would be, um, no, sorry, uh, because we did A first, B happens. What we have here is we found the tools needed to differentiate the teaching of cognitive genres, how to teach thinking in terms of patterns. And once you show this to teachers, 
they can play with this. They can do wonderful things with that. Uh, and we did that with our class, with my own geography class. And the more sophisticated the content, the more advanced a student's thinking, the complex the patterns becomes, the more complex the pattern becomes. So we can move from simple causal to multi-causal, which means that we can now equip the students with the tools to express subject conceptual knowledge at an ever more sophisticated and uh, appropriate level so that beginners can use their tools that they have because their thinking is not that advanced, because their cognitive development is different, of course, because they're children, to produce full texts, scientific texts even, that are adequate to their development. So even primary kids can uh, produce a lab report that has explanations and hypotheses and def definitions. But if we follow the idea of progression, we should be able to move intermediate learners into a field that is more complex and more sophisticated. So they can produce the same lab report, ideally at a more sophisticated level. So when a 12 or 13 year old uh, student explains something, it should be very different from the explanation of an eight year old student, ideally. Or if we have people of different abilities in one classroom, we now have the tools to advance their thinking by teaching them the patterns and the linguistic tools needed to move from one pattern to the next, which is a very different type of language than the language we use in, in, in standard language teaching. And finally, uh, upper secondary students, college students, should be able to move from the advanced field into the technical areas of the subject disciplines. So we are very, very happy and a little bit proud to uh, have come up with both a framework and practical tools and materials that shows uh, for various subjects. We, we did that for chemistry and for uh, history and for geography. Biology will follow very soon uh, of how teachers can model those learning progressions for several subjects at various levels. So we are now able, and it took us a lot of work, to show how to uh, help students create a lab report at an ever-increasing uh, level of depth and processing so that their definitions become more sophisticated, which in turn means exactly that their conceptual understanding has improved. And the reason why I wanted to show you that video is that that is something that can only be done if we create a learning environment that really puts the learner first. We need to rethink scaffolding. We need to uh, rethink what it actually means to be learner focused. We need to rethink our understanding of learning, our, uh, the relationship between language and content and so on and so forth. But as the video showed, it's perfectly possible to do so. And we are also confident that we have now come up with a model that actually takes learning to a new level. That we have finally been able to move beyond CLIL in the way that we now know exactly what that integration that nobody's talked about before actually is all about. We believe that working towards literacies is the next evolutionary step in truly integrating language and content. And on our website, you will find all those materials. You will even find lesson plans and tools. And I firmly believe, and, and if I can thank the people that helped us here, then I would gladly do so, because that is something that we could only do because we got help from the community itself. So the CLIL community helped us to actually go beyond CLIL. We thank you very much. So do we have questions? Because I would then gladly hand you the microphone. 
N not a question, but, but thanks for the, the three presentations. And, and what I thought was interesting is how closely they fit together. It was very interesting to see how um, Ellie's descriptors fit into the kind of contents you, you were going there, that we were looking at the same kinds of categories uh, in the three. Um, just a comment from having been trying out Ellie's descriptors in a school context and not with minority or migrant children, but with children in a mainstream school and which was implementing bilingual teaching and where it was found that, that it gave guidance for lesson objectives and also real guidance for subject teachers who hadn't thought about the language categories of what they were doing. Um, interestingly, it's a school with some bilingual classes and some non-bilingual classes, and the school is meeting an enormous problem because the bilingual classes are doing better in everything than the other uh, children, and, and, and it's, uh, it, it, it is actually a genuine one because the ones who are not going into the bilingual classes feel disadvantaged. The teachers who are allotted the non-bilingual classes say, I don't want these classes anymore. It's, it's a, a, a genuine problem, easily solved by making everything bilingual, but it's, it's, it, it's still a, a very interesting thing. And I, I was interested, very interested to see uh, Olivia taking it uh, even further in terms of of literacy, which is there. Are there any other comments apart from a wish for lunch? Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, just clarify, there are two, two levels. Each flyer is there in two versions, which are actually uh, Do you think, Oliver, that building knowledge in the way this video showed and the way uh, you talked about it. Uh, I think this is a lot about to think about for our project, but do you think that uh, challenged students need some basic uh, level of language competence in order to start building knowledge? Th that's a very important question, one which I do not have a definite answer for. But I do believe, let me put it this way, I do not believe any longer in the Bix and Kalp distinction in the way that it's been understood or misunderstood widely, that you need to do Bix first before you can move into the field of academic language. I don't believe that anymore. I learned an incredible amount, or we gained a lot of insight from reading uh, Lentholf's book on uh, socio-cultural theory and language learning, uh, where he shows evidence that people from lower skilled, uh, uh, from lower backgrounds, from uh, stressful conditions, suffer um, from uh, cognitive growth defects. So that stress actually affects uh, the cognitive development. My wife is a special needs teacher, and she will often uh, tell me uh, stories such as that children who speak German perfectly well at a big level are still not able to follow their German teacher because she speaks academic language at a primary level. Uh, so what I believe is not so much, it's not about language skills as, it's, as it is familiarizing people and guiding them into the field of academic language. And I think that is something that we need to do uh, at a very early level. That we need to play games in kindergarten. We have a very funny game at home that we played with uh, our children. It's, it's, it's called uh, Can Pigs Fly? And what it actually is, it's a game where you start categorizing. So is this a mammal? Is this a fish? Is it somehow endangered? Uh, does it have hair? Does it have uh, whatever? Is it a predator or not? Uh, to help build these types of thinking or, or a cognitive function. So I think it's more a question of familiarizing students with this sort of discourse, which can start very early. And um, I have experience at, at, at what, what many European countries will call a later or late primary, which is at the age of uh, 10 and 11 that I taught myself. And uh, I can just uh, say that it's very easy for kids to accept academic language which would be something like increase, decrease, work with complex graphs and everything, uh, which we as language teacher would only introduce five years later because we think words like increase, decrease, those are hard words. 
which they are in there, just labels for a simple function, basically. Concept. Yeah, and for concepts. So I think if we focus on that, and if teachers are aware of that, that is something that we can start very early on. Also, from my own experience with, uh, with uh, eighth grader, for instance, uh, they are perfectly able to relate to the meta language. So I could start uh, talking to them about, you know, is this a good explanation? But first we had to be clear on what a good explanation is. So do we have cause and effect? And are you sure that you can link them well? Which sounds very complicated in a way, but it isn't. And the thing that was very, very inspiring to me is when I, uh, one of these kids actually approached me and said, um, if that is what you want from us, then why don't you tell us? It's so easy. It's not that big a deal. And I think that's the problem. It's, it's not so much a problem of language threshold as much as it is as a matter of a learning environment and maybe a, a, a new perspective on inclusivity, what, what that means in, in a school context in terms of cognitive development. I really think that Landhoff is right when he talks about a pedagogical imperative, that we cannot be uh, satisfied uh, that we, once we know that you know stress affects cognitive development, uh, then we must do everything we can to counterbalance that. And language is a tool that we can use. Uh, it's just uh, uh, a matter of shaping awareness. And I think we should uh, begin as early as we can. You can start comparing things in kindergarten and uh, scaffolding the kind of language uh, children need. It doesn't even have to be serious teaching but it's a way of uh, accompanying those functions. So I'm not sure, Ellie, if that is a satisfying answer. Uh, what I do believe is, and I've spoken to the people of the Council of Europe, that uh, we need to rethink also the common European framework because it does not have uh, a dimension for the academic development. And I think we can start developing academic language at a level that is not compatible with the Sefer. So I think we can teach A2 learners to use C1 words because they're just labels for concepts, which I don't know how to realign that with the framework. I know that the people at the Council of Europe are currently thinking about that question and, uh, and thinking about whether you know it's worth to start this new endeavor of coming up with, with something like a Sefer for the subjects, but that's a huge undertaking. So that was my attempt at coming up with a satisfying answer. And to be honest, I don't know. But we will find out hopefully soon. If it's a huge undertaking, we must start now. Yes, yes. We or must start now. Yes. Good <laughs> <laughs> idea. Uh, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you.